Okay, so today I'm here to talk about uh, validating um, protocols at the E1 and hopefully at the E2 level using AI agents. So we focused on the AI technique uh, known as reinforcement learning and you may be wondering why are we looking at this? Um, how does it fit? Um, why are we looking at machine learning? And I'm going to explain all of this and talk you through uh, why we decided to go that road. So in the past, we've looked at something called selfish mining, which is a strategy and attack on the Ethereum 1.x um, protocol, where essentially you're trying to attack the network, manipulate uh, the difficulty calculation, and uh, you do this by essentially keeping a uh, private chain that it's ahead. Uh, so essentially, you don't send your blocks as soon as you receive them, but you will hold them and send them strategically as you keep uh, getting heads from other miners. And so the idea is that you're going to make them waste their time by looking at the blocks that you just sent, and you always keep ahead so that you ensure that you're winning. And so this is a problem that's been studied um, in different papers, and there's different algorithms that you can follow. As I described before, you can uh, hold a number of blocks, and whenever you have a lead, if someone sends you a block that is increasing the general height, you publish a block that you have already mined for that height. And essentially always keeping ahead so that you ensure that you can maximize the reward that you're getting. Um, because when you send them, you'll either get a main chain reward or an uncle reward, which are almost essentially the same. And so I work with the Pegasus team at Consensus, and we focus on research. So we've developed a framework to build simulations for different types of protocols. So we've looked at proof of work, proof of stake, and so we decided it would be pretty um, interesting to implement a selfish attack and look at the data that would, would return. So this is a bit of the code that it looks like. We actually took the calculation of the difficulty. We're looking at how it's done in Ethereum really, just to get a sense of what the rewards are. And so depending on what you're doing, as I mentioned before, you can get a reward from uh, mining a block, which is right now 2 ETH, with the transactions included, and if you include any angles that you receive. So your reward may vary um, to 175, 125, or 2. Um, and since the transaction fees that you receive is quite small sometimes, we decided to not include this in our own simulation. And so we decided to build a test case where you only have a network of um, nine miners who are always honest, and then you have an honest miner um, that is selfishly mining. And so what happens is that there's some variation, and uh, we decided not to include the rewards of transactions, and some of the results are this. So essentially what we found is that once you have 25% of the hashing power of the network, you can start attacking it and doing selfish mining, and this is more beneficial for you. Um, because this manipulates the difficulty calculation, and it increases your reward. So the more hashing power you have, um, the better for you. And so we wanted to test um, how would this prove if we were giving it to a reinforcement learning agent? And since we have actual data to back it up, we could compare the results and see what we would get with it. And so that's why you might be wondering why are we doing reinforcement learning when we're more focused on blockchain. Um, but just to give you like a sense of what reinforcement learning is, in case you haven't heard it, is the concept where you have a piece of software, it's an agent that's interacting with an environment. One of the most famous ones is uh, DeepMind, uh, where they implemented a deep Q network, and essentially it's interacting with different Atari games and it learns how to solve them. So we thought, okay, we can take this concept and implement it into different protocols and just see what happens. And just to like make a sense of why we chose that too, is because it's an automated system that essentially has proven to beat humans and many other algorithms and strategies. So it just made sense to go that route. So how does that work? Uh, you have this loop where you have an agent that is collecting observations in the environment. So it's partial information on the current state. And then you have actions that you can take uh, which will return a reward based on those actions. And so the, pr the process continues in some loop uh, where you just keep iterating to different actions in different states. And so what are the different observations that you can get in terms of uh, our protocol? We're looking at the number of blocks mined, the number of blocks received, the percentage of on-calls, the different things that you're actually 
um, doing in the network and feeding that information into the agents so they can learn um, the impact of their actions. And so to reduce complexity, we didn't want to be too broad in terms of what a miner can do. So we decided that you could only mine um, up to 10 blocks hidden in your own uh, private chain. And you should be able to publish up to three blocks in a row. So you could uh, publish one, two, or three based on whatever strategy uh, seems the best. And then you would get some reward based on that. And so I think the most complicated part of setting this up is trying to understand what is the best reward you can give to an agent because you want to give rewards such that it understands um, what's the optimal strategy to pick and also how to discover selfish mining without necessarily implementing the entire set of actions that it needs to do. And so what we decided to do in our case is to incentivize uh, staying ahead, uh, just mining as many blocks as possible um, faster than the other miners. Uh, but there's other strategies that you can take. Uh, we tried and tested a few to see what was the most optimal result, but eventually just decided that uh, using the metric of staying ahead was probably the best. And so going back to what this loop looks like, we have this agent that has been implemented in Python and it's calling code that is implemented in Java, this network simulator. And it's essentially going through this loop over and over again, um, selecting actions, and then collecting the information that it gets from the simulation. And so there's a number of different algorithms that you can use. As I mentioned before, like one of the most famous is the two networks. Um, but you can also do model-free, Q-learning algorithms, policy grading-based algorithms. They all play on different sets of statistics and modeling and use um, market chains as the back um, of how they calculate uh, different states and rewards. And so we decided that probably the simplest one to go for uh, was Q-learning. And so I'm just going to explain a little bit uh, what Q-learning is, essentially. So we use this uh, Python framework. It's developed by OpenAI. And it allows you to create your own environment, an interface that you can use. And so we developed that calling the Java code. And then we tested for many different scenarios. So we wanted to see what was the best strategy when you have 10% of the hashing power, 40%, and 60%. And then we set some hyperparameters that are related to these uh, Q tables and how you calculate the reward. So you look at the learning rate, um, which essentially is just telling you how much you value you, uh, new information that you receive versus information that you've recorded in the past. And we also have a discount factor, uh, which also pertains to the reward. You want to look at the current reward that you get for an action plus the reward for making a next action, because you're trying to discover what is the most optimal path. And so it's something that you have to tune in terms of how do you value um, a future reward, because you can think, OK, I can mine a block right now, just send it as soon as possible, and I get a reward of two. But if I decide to wait um, a couple of blocks ahead to publish it, um, there's time that goes by, and so money um, might cost less because of things like inflation. Or you can just think, well, I mine uh, four blocks in one minute, that's negligible, it's worth the same. So based on what you value most, you will tune on this parameter. And then finally you have epsilon, which is just related to randomness. How many choices do you do that are random versus how many choices do you do that you're maximizing um, your strategy by picking the biggest reward. And so there's two states, as I mentioned before. The first one is driven by epsilon, where you're just trying to make random choices of the different actions you can take and recording the results that you get in this table. And then this will allow you to generate different values so that you can reach uh, an optimal and deciding what is the best action at each um, state that you reach. And so and then there's some theory behind this that you use uh, something called Bellman equations. And it just says that basically by maximizing at each uh, state that you find yourself what is the optimal um, action, you will maximize for the entirety of your decision process. And so you're just uh, looking, as I mentioned before, at the reward, and then you're also adding the value of the future reward of a next state in action, but with a discounted factor. So that's what I was talking about before, that 0 0.9 value. And so just to make this a little bit more concrete, because it can be very abstract, 
Uh, we can think about this Q-matrix being something like this, where you uh, have four different actions, so you can hold your block and not publish it, just keep it in the private chain. Um, you can publish one block, two or three, as I mentioned before, this is the different sets of actions you can take. And then you can hold one, two, three, four, and more, but for simplicity in this example, it cuts it three. And so when you start, you initialize it, and all the values are at zero, and as you keep uh, going randomly through the actions, you'll change the values. So let's just walk through one of these examples. So let's say that you start, and you start an action, you decide to hold, and so you're going to calculate what happens when you hold, and then maybe the next step, you want to publish it. So that will generate a reward, let's say 2 e. And so you continue doing this through random paths until you've uh, generated enough values. This is like random values, it's not the actual ones. But just to give you an idea of what happens. And then after a certain point, what you start doing is that, okay, I find myself at a state of holding two. So I have two blocks, what is my next best action? Should I publish them or should I hold them? And so you pick the maximum uh, value for each action and that's how you can find an optimal path. And so, as I mentioned um, briefly, there's a, the Markov chain process that backs all of this information and ensures that this equation holds true. And it's just an idea so that you can also visualize this in a different way. You can have a chain where you're mining and then you can start your own private chain and keep switching between one and the other. And then, essentially because of the properties of a market chain, you, you reach a steady state. And that's why this um, table is useful, because you can assume that after a certain number of steps, uh, you've reached the same if you were up to infinity. And so that's how you can um, maximize the values. And so there's a lot of potential challenges uh, when taking this approach, because you need to understand what's the best data that you need to feed. You need to test for all these hyperparameters and keep changing them until you can find something optimal. And it's also a consideration of how do you build this, um, what are the behaviors that you want to incentivize, how do you define something that's Byzantine, and so on. There's a lot of things that you can uh, find challenges with. And so just to go back to our example of proof of work, uh, we took observations, we were just tracking what is the uh, number of blocks that you've uh, published in the public chain, and the private chain, I'm keeping track of uncles and forks, and then um, letting it know so that they can make the best actions. And so we ran this uh, similar to what we ran in the self-contained simulation, nine honest miners and then one Byzantine miner that is acting uh, through the reinforcement learning agent. So we measured it at 10, 40, and 60% hashing power, and we collected the results. And so, as I mentioned before, we use the simulator in Java, we use this framework, OpenAI in Python, um, some of the typical machine learning libraries, and then we ran all of these tests in AWS um, so that we could test and collect all the data. And so, this is just, again, an overview of what we were doing at the different hashing rates. We collected the reward over a total of one hour of mining. We also collected it over the total of um, about 10,000 episodes or simulations. So essentially, I'll, run, I'll let my agent run for an hour or until it has mined um, a thousand blocks and record that behavior. And I run it uh, for 10,000 episodes while you're changing the actions that you select. And we also measure for three different strategies. We just wanted to make sure that uh, we were performing better than if you were just mining honestly, or if that you were mining just randomly. And we wanted to compare the results. Um, so what did the results look like? Uh, we found that when you ran it for uh, even just like a thousand episodes, the agent um, that was incentivized to hold his chain at 10% is actually performing worse because the reality is that at 10%, you're, not, you're never gonna be ahead of all the other miners. You don't have enough power. So you just end up losing more. However, at 40%, uh, you already start getting an increase in your reward. After maybe like 500 episodes, you're gonna already see a little bit of an improvement in terms of what you're doing. And then at 60%, it's just like taking over the network. So the results, um, I, we summarized them here. And we're also looking at this metric, which is the ratio of blocks you've mined. So this is how many blocks did you mine versus the number of total blocks mined. So what you see here is that uh, for 10%, you're doing worse. 
um, than if you were just being honest. Like 40% though, you, you start improving. Uh, we set two different reward systems just to test things. And for one of them, it was uh, starting to be better at 40% while acting selfishly. So he's getting like almost 50% of the blocks, which is in a slight increase. Um, and at 60% it's just mining all of the blocks because you get such a huge advantage uh, from selfish mining that essentially you're publishing most of the blocks because nobody can catch up to you and what happens is that you're also decreasing the difficulty of blocks so you can mine faster with the same uh, hashing rate. And so what are some of the key takeaways of all of this? Is that um, at 60% you're doing a lot of damage but we all know that even like at that percent you should be able to do a lot of damage. At 40% uh, you start achieving some interesting results, but one of our hopes was that by implementing this automated way, we would find perhaps other flaws, something different than selfish mining, a different strategy, and then at 10% it's just doing very poorly. Um, and so, like I mentioned before, at 60% you're producing over 90% of the blocks, but what's interesting is that you're not actually making any more money. If anything, you'll be making around the same amount of Ethereum. Um, and so, I mean, you're just attacking the difficulty, but it's not necessarily beneficial. And, uh, yeah, we couldn't find a better strategy than selfish mining. But it's interesting because then what you can do is use these types of systems to test different protocols and understand if there's something going on. So perhaps you can see, see it as a signal detection system that there's something wrong with the protocol because if you don't follow the normal strategy, you're doing better. And so, this can help you understand and evaluate in different ways um, what's happening. And you shouldn't just uh, think that this is a wholesome solution, but rather a good indicator of what can happen. And so this is an open source project. It's all on GitHub. So if anyone feels like they want to test their own protocols, you're welcome to do it. And 